Welcome to Cheese in Depth. I'm Michael Landis, and today I have Pat Ford on, and he's with Beehive Cheese. And uh, we're going to talk about ingredients and different things that you can do with the cheese. And one of the things that he does so well is his rubs. And uh, you know, when you when you look at some of the things that you can use, uh, it's really just amazing what it can do to a cheese and how it brings out a lot of the flavors. And but it's not as easy as it seems. And he'll explain that as we go along. But first, since this is the American Cheese Month, I thought we would start off with a simple question asking Pat, what was his first experience like at ACS? First time there, Pat? So our first ACS was in Portland in 2005. Um, we started making cheese in September. And so we had, basically not even started making cheese yet when we went to our first ACS, but it was amazing. It was so cool. We met so many people. Everybody was so helpful. And I mean, we always joke about it being summer camp, but it was summer camp. We met a lot of people. It was somewhat intimidating um, to be with a bunch of people that we knew of and loved their cheeses, but um, they were very gracious and kind. And again, you forged lifelong friendships at those conferences. And we met a lot of people that we ended up doing a lot of business with over the years. So ACS was imperative. It was, it was fundamental to our success and the relationships that we, we found there. <clears throat> You have been on many committees. For those that are thinking about, uh, you know, volunteering and all that, what's, uh, what's your advice for somebody to uh, get involved? Do it. I was a treasurer and secretary on the board for six years. Um, it was amazing. I have learned so much and forged, again, so many relationships with amazing people and the people that we served in the ACS membership, we were able to really help out. Um, the CCP program, Sue Sturman and um, Sasha Davies were so critical to the, be the beginning days of that. And they basically, the first year that the uh, CCP happened, I was on the board and that was kind of my baby. It was, I was in charge of making sure that came off good. And it was amazing. But I would just suggest get involved in whatever committee you want to or you can. And they really love to see some um, participation before you get jump onto the board, for instance. Get your feet wet on some of the committees. Um, volunteer at conference. Be part of the, you know, the judging and competition, whatever. So. It's just get involved, get to know people, have fun. I mean, just uh, for instance, we were brand new. We didn't know what we were doing. And we ran into Jeff Jarrett with um, Caves of Fairboat. Everybody knows Jeff. We love Jeff. And, you know, we had some problems with some mechanical openings with our cheeses up front. And he laughed. And I said, it's really not funny. Why are you laughing? And he's like, just turn the air down on your press, your pneumatic press, and we did, and it fixed the problem. So, you know, there are so many years of experience. I remember asking Sid Cook one time with um, Car Valley Cheese, I said, Sid, and it's kind of a dumb question, but I said, what's the most important step of cheese making? And he laughed again, like, you, you novice, and patted me on the shoulder, but he said, and it was profound, he said, the most important step of cheese making is the step you're at right then right now if you mess up something you can't fix it down the line so you've got to do everything right as you go along the way and so just you you end up meeting and talking to and learning and growing and collaborating with pretty much everybody you meet if you engage if you don't and you just go and walk around and don't engage then you're not going to get nearly as much out. you know the thing that we've loved so much about the cheese industry as well is it sounds funny, but my very favorite people to see at conference are my competition. And I, we just don't view them that way. We view them as our peers and our friends. 
and are people we can give a big hug to hopefully now with the COVID might be going away a little bit. But, you know, we collaborate, we talk about problems that we're having, we talk about solutions and everybody shares. And it's just so, it's so fun to just be able to talk and help each other out. We have, there's lots of opportunity. I've always, this is a story that I always love and Zoe probably will be mad at me for telling it, but we were doing a session and um, Peg from Calgary was there, Allison from Vermont Creamery and um, Zoe was there. And Peg was supposed supposed to follow Zoe's presentation. She said, I am not following her. She's too, she's just too good. And that's not the way she put it, obviously. She threw in a few expletives. But anyway, again, I mean, we could call up Zoe right now or anybody in the industry and say, I'm having this problem or I have this idea. Zoe and I talked just the other day and she was talking about, you know some stuff and we just collaborated and talked and it was fun so it's a great industry all right so let's uh let's get to uh, your program and uh, uh i'm gonna turn it over to you for a little bit so you can talk about uh beehive cheese and some of the things and you have a little video and uh you know then uh, we'll uh, talk about and taste some cheese how's that sound awesome i think i'm gonna start with this short little video on Pack Board at Tim Welsh opened Beehive Cheese with this cave of cheese and experience between the two of them. What they lacked in experience, they made up with enthusiasm and grit. They also had the help of their families. Check out this photo from 2005. Many of these folks still work at Beehive. In 2007, we won our first award for Barely Buns, and that launched us into the artisan cheese world. We get our cow's milk from Wayland Dairy, located about 10 miles west of us on the Great Salt Lake. Clint Wade is a third generation dairy farmer and has a mixed herd of Jersey and Holstein cows. We have a great partnership with Wadeland Dairy and we've used their milk ever since we opened. Welcome to the West Building. This is where you'll find the creamery and our tiny retail shop. Wade's Dairy Milk Truck delivers fresh milk to this dock every midday. The two silos to the right are filled with whey that's stored to be hauled away and recycled with paints and other non-consumable products. It takes about three hours to make a batch of cheese. Here's a low wheel working the pasteurizer. From there, we fill the bath, warm the milk in a gentle steam bath, and then add rennet and cheese cultures. And then we wait for the curd to set. Here's Sean cutting the curd to make sure we have a good break before we use a special harp to cut the curd into smaller bits. Next, we send the curd over to the finishing table and fill the bath again for another round of cheese making. Here's a time lapse video of that process. All throughout the process, we're checking pH levels. Since we never standardize our milk, we must adjust our recipe based on the seasonality of the milk. The seasonal variation of milk composition means that we cannot rely on every batch progressing exactly the same way. Next, we drain the whey. Some of it goes to make fresh ricotta, and the rest goes to the whey silos outside. There's more waiting, more pH testing, and when the time is right, we cut the curds into 40 pounds flat. This begins the cheddaring process of flipping and stacking the slabs until, you guessed it, the pH is correct. <laughs> all right, the slabs go into the mills to make what we all think of as fresh cheese curds. Those curds are salted until they're ready to be made into a beautiful wheel of beehive cheese. We press the 20 pound wheels, trim them, and some go off to become rubbed fine cheeses like Barely Buzzed or Big John's Cajun, and the others age as promontory or base cheddar. We age our cheese for about six months at 55 degrees and then it's off to be cut and packaged. Here's a cool perk for our employees. Four days per week, he has Chef Heather cook lunch for the crew. On to the East Building. Here is where the sales team lives, as well as the shipping department. We palletize large orders here and fulfill your online orders. Hey, there's Hayden on the forklift loading a pallet for a local distributor. 
From there, our cheese goes all over the country, especially to California. We also still participate in our local farmer's market. Community is a core value for us. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we've donated about 130,000 pounds of cheese to our local food banks and food pantries. We're excited to be delivering our cheese to the Utah Food Bank today. None of this would be possible without the hard work and dedication of our cheese crew. They are total rock stars. Thanks again for visiting us here in Utah, and thank you to the California Artisan Cheese Guild for adopting our little community in northern Utah. Hello, and welcome to all the movement for your beehive cheese virtual tour. Um, that was a little video we produced for the California Artisan Cheese Guild, but it, it pretty much reflects everything that we do. Um, so kind of going back to the start, my brother-in-law is my business partner, Tim Welsh, and he called me up one day about 16 years ago, and he laughed. He said, Pat, I think we should go make cheese. And I'm like, well, we both have jobs. And he says, well, let's quit them and let's go make cheese. And we, we laughed and laughed and thought about it and saw a lot of opportunity. There was some beautiful cheeses starting to be made in the U.S. And um, we thought time is right, and away we went. We went up to Utah State, they're an ag school, and they helped us develop our promontory um, recipe. Promontory is the base from which we do, can't see it very well. Promontory is the base from which we do all of our cheeses because our cows are Jersey cows. We get a lot of cream, a lot of uh, protein, and our cheeses, what we like to call it's more or less an Irish style cheddar. And it's just a nice creamy cheese. And let's go ahead and taste that. Michael, you can chime in as well. You've got cheeses. So our promontory actually has won more awards for us than any of our other cheeses, but it's the base from which we do all of our cheeses. So just a nice creamy, foundation platform from which we build all of our cheeses, except for uh, two cheeses. We do our, our fresh ricotta, we do curds, and we also do a cheese called Beehive Fresh. And it's uh, interesting cheese. Going back to what I said earlier about what Sid Cook said, he said the most important process step is where you are right then. So when you're cheddaring the cheese, you're flipping those slabs over. What do you think, Michael? There you go. He's not moaning, but he's smiling. That's good. Um, when you're flipping those slabs over, you're waiting for basically two things to happen. You're waiting for the moisture to come out of the cheese, and you're also waiting for the bacteria to eat a bunch more lactose or sugar and make acid. And that acid is paramount in the aging process. But if you don't slow down that acid production, you'll end up having too much and then you, it won't age properly. So the way you slow it down is you mill the cheese curd into the slabs into curds so you can expose a lot of surface area and then you introduce salt. You saw that in the video. By introducing the stop, it, salt, it stops the bacteria from producing more acid and you get this a nice, perfectly balanced cheese. Our beehive fresh, on the other hand, what we'll do is instead of milling the slab, we dry salt rub on the outside of the slabs. And by so doing, the salt doesn't slow down the bacteria. It takes several days for that salt to wick, wick its way into the cheese. And therefore, we end up with kind of a sour, creamy, acidic, the acid is way too high in this cheese. So it would not age well, but we don't care because we sell it in about three weeks. And it's just got a real, it's amazing on like pizza and it's just a great cheese that's called beehive fresh but it illustrates what things happen in the cheese if you don't take every step seriously what did you just you just grab some preserves what is that red pepper jelly oh that sounds good and uh a rosemary 34 degree cracker. Oh, there you go. Because this is, you know, this has, like what you were saying, 
It's a great platform. You know, this is not a, a high salty, high acid, high, you know, sharp cheese. This has got a lot of butter. It has a, a, a nice balance of tang. And I'm not saying that it doesn't have sharpness. It, it has enough that really brings in a very pleasant and easy, uh, you know, e easy to eat like the whole piece. <laughs> it's so nice. But it's that English style, which has got a little bit of that, uh, I I, the best way I would describe it is a little earthy, you know, there's a little earthiness to that, which is really nice. But, you know, it, it works with just about any direction that you want. I like spicy uh, because with this, the, and, and you know with the hatch chili, uh, is that any heat, it basically neutralizes the heat. So you're able to, you know, really taste the, uh, the real red peppers here without getting that hot burn. You get the flavor. And that's one of the advantages of this creamy, buttery cheese. Thank you. Yeah. So we know you guys know this, but we're from the Beehive State, thus Beehive Cheese. We're from Utah. And we're a high mountain desert here. I mean, we're at 5,000 feet. Um, it's dry, super dry. And to age a cheese properly in a cave, you need 95% humidity. And um, it's probably 25% humidity outside of it. So when we first started, we were open air aging some cheese. We did a cloth bound cheddar that was a really an amazing cheese. But we'd get these basically crevasses in the cheese cracks because it was too dry. And we fought it and we tried and we tried to humidify the, the cave. It, there was no, no having it. So, you know what? Rather than fight it, beat them, you rejoin them. And so, our rind ended up being a plastic um, vacuum sealed bag. And really the, you know, the purpose of the rind, in addition to creating different flavors and whatnot, but for the most part, the rind protects the taste of the cheese from oxygen. And so our plastic bag protects the cheese from oxygen. And so we had to be creative because of the desert that we live in. And so, when we first made Promontory, uh, it's a great cheese, but there are a lot of amazing white cheddars out there. And we wanted to do something a little bit more interesting. And Tim, my brother-in-law, just had this stupid, crazy idea. You know, you put cream in coffee, why not put coffee on cream? And so <clears throat> away we went. The first two experiments that we did was our sea hive, which is our honey and salt rubbed cheese and our Barely Buzz, which is our coffee and lavender rub cheese. And so I'll talk a little bit about Sea Hype right now. So um, we've all heard about the Sundance Film Festival. There used to be a sea in the middle of Utah, in Southern Utah called the Sundance Sea. And that sea went extinct a long, long time ago. And when it did, it left this strata of salt. And there's a mine down there, it's called Redmond Real Salt. It's kind of got a pink hue to it, amazing salt. We use the Redmond Real Salt and we use honey that is produced on our property um, just up the road, about six miles up the road. We have hives and we have bees and we have honey. And so we use our own honey. We use salt from Utah. We rubbed it on the cheese. And one of the things, again, going back to ACS, we have gotten, the, had the pleasure to get to know Mary Quick. And she's with Quick's Cheddar. She's been making cheese her whole life, her family has for years and literally centuries. And we, she said, Pat, I love your cheeses because they're balanced. They're, after all, I'm going to the store to buy a piece of cheese. I'm not going to buy salt and honey. And so when we started putting things on the outside of cheese, we wanted it to be accent the cheese, but not over flavor the cheese. And so Sea Hive is a really good example of that, where taste side by side with Promontory and Sea Hive, you're going to notice some big differences, but it's not in your face. You're not going to get sweet. You're not going to get salty. You're going to get just a nice balance. Uh, my brother, 
this is a goofy example, but my brother bought some really nice speakers one time and he sat me in a room, he made me close my eyes and he turned on some nice music and the whole room was just enveloped with music and you couldn't even tell where the speakers were, just the whole room filled with this beautiful sound. And that's the way we want our cheese to be. We want it to be just blow out. We don't want it to just hit you in the face with salt or honey or anything. But Sea Hive is really an amazing cheese. I love Sea Hive. <clears throat> My very favorite pairing with Sea Hive is just a nice gala apple in the fall. I mean, it's it's amazing. But Sea Hive, so when you get a, a new camera or a new iPhone, whatever, um, those, those little white um, silicon packets, they're desiccants. Those are to absorb the moisture in the with the camera so it doesn't stay wet or get moist. Both honey and salt are desiccants, they're natural desiccants. And so sea hive becomes drier because a lot of the liquid is wicked out of the cheese by those two natural desiccants. So sea hive is a great cheese. It's really great with like Marcona almonds, great with figs. But my favorite again is with an apple in the fall. Michael, I want you to chime in here a little bit. Tell me about your experience with Sea Hive. With the Sea Hive, uh, you know, there's 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 not that awe of the golden retriever sticks her head in because she wants cheese. All right. She does. Yes, yeah, she does. All right. <laughs> so uh, uh, the saltiness isn't like when you when I imagine that you're using sea salt, that it's crusted sea salt, and it's not. It has a, a little bit of uh, nice saltiness, but it's not overwhelming or anything like that. And the honey is very, very, like what you were saying, is like you hardly notice that. But what I did was uh, David Grimmels uh, sent me some uh, Little Mutt Valley uh, raw blackberry honey, and I slathered that on it. and you know, it brings out a little bit more of the saltiness. And so you kind of get a little bit more uh, of, of the, the flavors that kind of come out. I, I thought it was very nice. Tea hype was another experiment that we did. Um, it was kind of fun. We were actually had the opportunity to go to Portugal in the spring. And we were in Southern Portugal where there were, it was the most amazing thing because there were these beautiful citrus trees and they were on the sides of mountains. It wasn't like the flat orchard like we expect to see. These these citrus trees, these orange trees were all over the mountainside. And the whole countryside smelled of orange blossoms. It was amazing. And my sweet wife said, let's make a cheese that tastes like this smells. And I told him, my partner, and I said, let's make it orange blossom cheese and he laughed and he pulled out some Earl Grey tea which has bergamot in it and that's just a citrusy plant that they squish and they take they, they extrude the oils out of it and bergamot gave us that orange blossomy flavor. Tea hive is very interesting because it is almost like a palate cleanser. It's so clean and it's so um, floral and wonderful that when you're eating it you're just it's just it's just a delight and this one is amazing with bubbles just anything bubbles whether it's just a San Peregrino or champagne it's really great with bubbles but with the tea hive which the tea hive just by itself you know as, as when you think about a non uh, uh you know alcoholic beverage Teas go very well. Coffees go well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of flavors that you can get uh, that work well with cheese. And, and the tea is, is a beautiful match. It's, it's just a nice balance. So when you started talking about um, the orange blossom, I was thinking about how much I enjoy orange. So this is a... Uh, orange, uh, apricot orange spread that I have uh, with Bonnie's Jams. Uh, did some work with them on Tuesday and that. And uh, 
that's it's a nice orange is a is a wonderful flavor as well for it that is you know it's so interesting you would expect for a blackberry blossom honey to be a dark honey but when you think about blackberries the blossoms are pure white and so yeah. black, blackberry blossoms and blackberry honey is very light and wonderful yeah we it have is. a lot of blackberries it's it's very very light and it's uh you know it, it's one of those uh that you know i mean you know you're, you're, it's it it's not going to come out it's it it's it's in here it's thick it's you know it's magnificent you scrape it until you get the honey out and like i said with the cheese it just brings out more of that uh, you know that salt and uh the the honey comes out more so it's it's just a nice balance you know with these you really don't have to add anything in it and i think that's a nice part about it i think you know just enjoying the cheese the way that you've done them is is absolutely fabulous but they lend themselves also well to be able to do things with them so you have that option to be able to do that so i i always we always laugh because gordon edgar which we all know and love and he's just a great guy goofy guy but when we first made, and this will introduce our Burley Buzz, when we first made Burley Buzz, um, Michael, you took it to the, the Today Show. If yes. you remember, this was a long time ago, and you wanted a quote. And one of the quotes we called Gordon Edgar up, said, Gordon, give us a quote about Burley Buzz, because he was a judge at ACS that year when we won first place with that cheese. And he says, it's about the only cheese I've ever had that has stuff on it that doesn't suck. <laughs> so that was like, when we first started rubbing crazy stuff on cheese, people thought we were just these two yahoos from Utah that just didn't know what they can and can't do. And that's pretty much what it was. We didn't know what we couldn't do. When we told Utah State that we rubbed coffee on cheese, they kind of shook their head and they said, well, you can't do that. And we're like, well, come on down and tell us why. And they came down and they tasted it and they're like, well, um, um, and then they couldn't figure out a reason why. But they thought the acid in the, cheap, in the coffee would mess up all this stuff. But, you know, that's what put us where we are. We did stuff because we didn't know what we couldn't do. The example I love to tell, I've told it a hundred times, but um, we were at the fancy food show, ran into a guy with a big Swiss cross on his name badge, and we got to chatting and talking. He was a Greer importer, but we, we, he asked me what we did, and I said, we make a coffee cheese, and we rub coffee on cheese. We're a small creamery from Utah, and he says, I know this cheese, and then he told me this story. He said, I was at a restaurant, um, Casa Lula in New York City. And out comes a cheese plate, and Barely Buzzed is on this cheese plate, and he's there with his friend, and he just basically went into a tirade, saying, these stinking Americans, they dig this, what are they doing with our cheese? And, and the guy basically said, shut up, it wouldn't be on the cheese plate if it wasn't good, try it, open your mind a little bit. So he tries it, and he thinks, and he says, these brilliant Americans are doing things with cheese that they would be hung for in their country because it, they just don't do that. And so if I can do something that makes the cheese even better, um, then why not? And so I there's nothing better than a, just a nice extra virgin olive oil, for instance. I love olive oil. And then you add some citrus flavors and some people say, ah, I don't want that. I just want pure olive oil or I just want pure cheese. And I get that. But if we can do stuff that makes things more interesting. Uh, when we first introduced it, we were just kind of like, what are they up to? And now um, we're respected and people love the cheese. And so it's good. Barely buzzed, um, Tim's brother, roast the coffee down in Grand Junction, Colorado, about four, four hours from here. He sends us the beans whole. And in fact, right my, next to my office is our little uh, kitchen where we grind the coffee the morning that we're gonna make it. And one thing that's unique about our cheeses is we'll make the cheese that comes out of the press. 
We put it on a table. We rub coffee and lavender on this cheese. We vacuum seal it down. And other than aging, the cheese is done. So because our cheese has so much fat and cream in it, we all know that those fats absorb flavors like crazy. And so the coffee lives for five or seven or eight or whatever months on that cheese as it ages and the flavors go all the way to the center. I always tell people when they first taste Fairly Buzz to taste the cheese without the rind to start with. And you will, you will get the flavors have penetrated all the way to the middle of the wheel. And again, it won't just hit you in the face like, oh, but then it'll start to come through at the farmer's market when we first started introducing cheeses. You'd say, it's got coffee and lavender on it and they just keep walking and then they kind of turn around and come back and say, you did what? And then, I don't know if I'd like that. And like, well, there's a good way to find out and then they would taste it. And the rind is wonderful. All of our cheeses are, the rinds are edible and the coffee and lavender come out very wonderfully. Michael, you should have lots to say about Barely Buzz. This is the cheese that definitely put us on the map. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's one of those cheeses that uh, for the longest time was the ending of all of my cheese boards. You know, when I do a class and teach through there, I'd always have the barely buzzed on there because it was, it's such a great way to wrap up because it's, it could be a dessert in itself. It's kind of like at the end of a meal, having a little cup of coffee and, and a little dessert and, and having these together are, are just phenomenal. Uh, and, uh, I'm, I'm using it on Monday for an event that I have with a special event. And, and uh, you know, it's uh, a senior center. And uh, uh, I thought it would really be really fun. And everybody is just so anxious to, you know, to try that because they'd never, never even heard of it, you know. And so they're, they're really excited about that class. But uh, pairing wise, you know, there's just so much that you can do with this because the the coffee does lend itself. It's not a uh, an overpowering, but it is. It does penetrate through. Uh, the rind brings it up, but it doesn't give you like you're sucking on a uh, uh, a, a bean. Uh, it really does uh, add some nice flavor. Um, I'm pairing it up with a fat toad uh, goat caramel, uh, and this is a spicy. Um, um, dark chocolate. Oh, you're making me jealous. Dark chocolate, and, and this is absolutely fabulous. You know, the coffee, the chocolate there, you know, uh, and uh, it just, just brings out so many things. It, it, it just works easily together. So, you know, you can do a lot with that, make that a dessert, and also. Uh, I have a raspberry uh, spread that the chocolate, the raspberry, and this cheese with the coffee would be just crazy good, too. And I love it with um, Rustic Bakery's cocoa nib chocolate cookies. I mean, I love, I love it with that as well. It's really good. Yeah. I have yeah. some, some uh, Effie's cocoa, uh, which has got coconut in it, and it's uh, uh, malt uh, you know, in it. And so that's, it, it works out just drizzling the chocolate on that with the cheese and the coffee. And it's just fabulous. Just it's awesome. Yeah. And, it, and again, uh, like on all those, as I said before, you don't have to, you don't have to have anything additional to it. It lives and breathes and works very well on its own, but it is so nice to, you know, uh, dress it up occasionally. So I know you're a big beer connoisseur, Michael, but a brown beer, I mean, with the Barely Buzzed is awesome. Really good. The malts uh, in beer uh, and dark beers like that work out really well. 
a chocolate stout, a oatmeal stout works very well. An imperial stout does, you know, beautifully. But, you know, there's uh, uh, red ales that do really well because of that maltiness that, uh, that associates with it. So, you know, you can do that. Um, you know, Blue Moon does an iced coffee uh, beer. And uh, uh, I actually have it, uh, and, I, uh, and uh, I have tried it with uh, other things that, that works really well, but it would, it would work as well. That's good. When we first started, I took a trip down the west coast of um, California just to go visit some wineries. And it was hilarious because I visited about 20 wineries. And of the 20, I think 15 of them had our cheese already. I'm like, well, why did I even come? But our barely buzz with like, like a medium Pinot, a Pinot Noir is just insane. So coffee with the cheese and the, the wine is, is super good. So kind of fun. Yeah, I ran into Tim uh, uh, about maybe four years ago. I was teaching at the uh, California Artists and Cheese Festival. And you guys were there and he brought his little camper and, and all that. And we sat around, uh, uh, you know, uh, after the show, enjoying some cheeses and introducing it to some of the people that work there. People that work at festivals never get a chance to enjoy cheese because right. they're working. So, mm -hmm. you know, having an opportunity to tell everybody is, come on over here and sit down and enjoy is, is, is really nice. That's fun. Another thing about Barely Buzz that's interesting is it is my go-to um, grilled cheese sandwich cheese. It makes no sense at all, but it's, of all of our cheeses that I have, I love the Barely Buzz. Red Butte Hatch Chili is a close second, but I do mine out of Barely Buzz. I love that cheese. So, okay, so last cheese, um, pour me a slice. It is our Basil Hayden bourbon washed cheese. I got a call from John Antonelli about three years ago and he said I've got a Basil Hayden bourbon sales rep in my office and they want to make they want to do a che or cheese and bourbon pairing and we said well why don't we wash the cheese with the bourbon and we did um, we formed a beautiful partnership with uh, Basil Hayden Beamstone Pori and we rolled this cheese out in New York on Halloween a year and a half ago. And it was so fun because the next day we're in Forbes magazine talking about this crazy pairing of cheese and bourbon. But wow, what an amazing cheese. That I guess is the word that we have. If we don't say wow, when we taste a cheese, a new experiment, like Michael said at the beginning, it's not easy to come up with a brand new cheese. But if we all say wow and we're clamoring to get more of the of the cheese, we know we have a success. And the Basil Hayden was a match made in heaven from the get go. As soon as we had it, um, I think the sweetness of the corn and the cheese is just it's amazing. But this cheese is very subtle. It is not going to burn your mouth with whiskey. It takes a minute to develop, but the finish on this cheese is, is amazing. But there are a lot of, sorry, that's really good. There are a lot of people out there that are moving away from wine and beer. They still are drinking wine and beer as well, but cocktails and bourbons and basil Hayden is just a real introductory, middle of the road, beautiful bourbon. And we love this cheese. It's just really a great cheese. Michael, you put me on a bourbon panel in Kentucky a while back, and it was hilarious because I don't drink bourbon. But <laughs> you're a bourbon connoisseur. Tell us about this cheese. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I had a, uh, uh, a four series show with uh, Adam Harris. He's the senior ambassador for Basil Hayden. And so we sat down and of course we did your cheeses first. Um, um, and uh, so we covered that and then we did Marike and a couple others. And it's, and Basil doesn't just have one, they have an entire line. They have Tenure, they have a, a dark rye, they have a Caribbean style with some molasses in it. 
So there's a lot of things they can do. It's 80 proof, which uh, is actually uh, for bourbon, pretty lightweight, you know? Um, you know, you get into 109 on the Knob Creek where, you know, that, that sets you back a little bit. Um, but it's just a great sipping, but also with, with cheese, it's fabulous. So um, I've been enjoying bourbon and, and cheese for a long time. IDDBA, I did a bourbon class. Uh, and uh, uh, next, not I think it's the 25th or 26th. I'm having Adam back on, and uh, we're doing cheese charcuterie and bourbon. So, that's uh, fun. <laughs> but uh, you know, amplifying it, uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, you know, being up and uh, getting up to Vermont and getting out with uh, the Fat Toad people, uh, they're they're wonderful. And this is a uh, uh, it's a uh, salted bourbon caramel, and you know. You don't really taste a lot of the, the bourbon bourbon, uh, you know, but it, again, what the uh, other things did with the cheese is excellent. So you have a little bit of bourbon, the, the flavor on the cheese. So you add a little bit here and it steps it up again. So you really get a nice amplification and it works really well. But, you know, just sitting down to a, a, a bourbon neat and the cheese, it works just just perfectly. And as a matter of fact, uh, that that sounds really good. When I get done here, I pour me a nice uh, nice neat bourbon, and uh, I'll uh, start finishing our work tonight. <laughs> there you go. We did a thing just before Christmas that was talking about how to um, continue to host a party during COVID times, and it was really crazy because they put up a big green screen behind us, and then they had this table. And I was actually speaking with Adam on one side and I was in another. He was in New York, I'm in Utah. And it looked like we were at the same table together. But I tell you, that was, it was nerve wracking because if you look left, you had to look right and it was all backwards. But we had a pretty fun conversation. But man, fun cakes with bourbon and um, just, you know, all these amazing foods. That fat toad stuff is just like, it's just creamy and delicious. It's amazing. So it's so cool. I, I've always said the fact that you're local is not a rite of passage into a nice restaurant, for instance, or a retail establishment as well. If we can make cheeses that are comparable or better than our European or world, the rest of the world, then heck yes, put our cheese on your menu and enjoy it. But if it's not as good, then shame on us, we've got work to do. And that's the cool thing about our industry. I mean, really the artisan cheese movement in, in the US is really 15 to 20 years old. And then, you know, like you mentioned with David winning the best of in the world, the, you know, blue cheese last year. Um, it's amazing. We as Americans are making amazing cheeses and um, we're earning our right at the table, so it's pretty fun that way. No, it's so fun. We've loved, we've loved the cheese industry, and we hope to love it for another 20 years. And um, it's so cool to see that. I remember I've, I've given this example before, but it was in Burlington, Vermont, in 2007, and the keynote speaker. I remember, he started the conference, the ACS conference. It was in a big tent, and they said is the sun rising or setting on artisan cheese? And we had just quit our jobs, build a creamery, and we were certainly hoping it was rising on artisan cheese. But, you know, they said at the time, I think the number was seven or 8% of Americans were eating artisan cheese. And now you've got really beautiful cheese sets, not only in just the amazing cheese shops of the world, like Antonelli's in Austin, um, you have got, beautiful cheese sets in Kroger's and Publix and big cheese retailers. And, and so, you know, you can have really wonderful cheese and have the opportunity to enjoy cheese and you can go in and you can get to know your cheesemonger and you can say, I am kind of scared of this type of cheese. Help me out. I don't necessarily like this type of cheese. And, 
And you know, the cheesemonger will say, well, let's give you a really mild, let's give you a bay blue to start with. And you're going to say, oh, I kind of like that. And then, you know, they'll work you into it and they'll also make you look really good at your party because they're going to think, wow, you really know your stuff. But really the cheesemonger, you know, knows their stuff and they are making you look good. So get to know the cheesemongers, get to know try some new things and you'll have a new favorite cheese every week and you're then you'll just say oh i love all of them so well when my wife and i i mean this is a this is crazy but when tim was trying to convince me to quit my job and and go make cheese we went to a little cheese shop in salt lake called liberty heights fresh it's a beautiful little garage that rolls up it's just a beautiful beautiful spot but we had a couple of cheeses and this one cheese I really liked. I wrote down the name of it because I didn't want to forget it because I really liked it. It was Parmigiano Reggiano. <laughs> and so that's how much I knew about cheese when we started. But my wife, she to this day does not like goat cheese. We had goats growing up and anyway, it she just doesn't do goat cheese. But we devoured a Harbison the other night and Five years ago, if I had given her a, a round of Harbison, she would have she would have shot me because there's no way she was going to eat that. And I mean, I'm like, I'm like are you going to leave me some, dear? I mean, we devoured the whole thing. And um, Zoe will be, this was crazy. We are having a chuck roast and we had Harbison and a baguette. And I tell you, the chuck roast, kind of burnt chuck roast was insanely good with Harbison. It sounds really weird, but oh, it was amazing. But again, we all are evolving and learning and finding new favorites all the time. And then you go back to the old favorites, but it's so fun. Funny story too. So my dad, um, we introduced him to Andy Hatch and he had some Pleasant Ridge Reserve and he was instantly in love for life. And so dad was ordering, ordering the cheese off of their website and he felt like he was cheating on us because he was he loved the Pleasant Ridge Reserve so much. And we're like, Dad, it's okay. But yeah, it's fun. It's so fun. We have we have just a teeny little retail sell shop here at the creamery. But we have our friends cheese in that in that case and we sell it and and just promote it. And it's it's a great community. Thank you for everybody. And Michael, thanks to you for promoting cheese through COVID. Um, we've all had a, you know, huge change, life-changing experiences last year. And um, we, I'll just tell one story. They talked about in the video donating some cheese, but you know, come April last year, we were producing four days a week, and all of a sudden our POs turned off. We were done. There was no POs coming in, whether it was retail, food service. It was just crazy. And so we slowed down on producing. And when we slowed down, then our dairies like, hey, guys, I'm still milking. What are we going to do? And um, anyway, uh, Dairy West is a Utah co-op where they, um, so for every 100 pounds of milk that's milked, they put a nickel in a, in a rainy day fund. And so they actually bought the milk, paid for our labor only, and we donated the cheese to the local food banks. We made curds and we sent out 130,000 bags of one pound bags of curds to the local food banks. And, you know, we all teamed up together and we got through it. And again, it was, it was a collaborative um, effort. Retailers were calling us up saying, Hey, what do you need to sell? Because we, we don't want you to go away during this year. So we have, Lots. Thank you so much to everybody for supporting us and, and helping us through a tough time. And we're not out of it yet. We need to keep supporting our restaurants and keep supporting our, our local creameries. That's about all I've got, Michael. Happy that you're getting better with, uh, you know, that things are getting better for you guys and that uh, it's, you know, it's emerging. And uh, I can, you know, tell from, uh, you know, some of the projects that are coming up on my radar is that, you know, that education is coming back in. That means that 
There's people out there that are getting, that are talking to the cheesemongers. There's new cheesemongers coming online, and uh, that's that's really cool. So the stores are expanding, and I think it'll be I think we'll be looking much better for coming up next year. This year. <laughs> this year too. Well, you know, we already know that because uh, you know we can yeah. feel the, the 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 differences. But yeah. So. So Pat, it's wonderful to see you as always. And, uh, you know, I, I want to thank you so much for spending the time with us and enjoying a nice hour of uh, Beehive Cheese and some of the stories and history and uh, just uh, lovely, lovely cheese. Thank you. Thank man. you, Michael. You're awesome. You're an amazing ambassador of cheese. So thank you so much. Everybody have a great day. We appreciate you, and we'll see you soon at, at a conference or something. Absolutely. I'm saying that we'll see each other in San Francisco uh, beginning of next year. Start it off. That'll be great. Um, yeah. Thank you, guys. Right. We'll see you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.